Question we ask ourselves every time we gaze deep into the endlessness of space. And the dream of discovering the origins of humankind is as old as civilization itself. Are there other worlds that support life? Or is life on Earth merely a cosmic accident? What in fact is life? What forms of life are there? And what constitutes higher intelligence? And most importantly, what are the prerequisites for the emergence of life? We naturally need solid ground under our feet. That's a planet with an atmosphere and the right temperature. But the question is, how many Earth-like planets are there out there? Or is the Earth unique? And crucially, if there are a lot of Earth-like planets, how likely is it that higher forms of life evolve on them? Just a few decades ago, scientists believed our solar system was unique. But it turns out to be just one of many. It's now clear that pretty much every star has a planetary system, and an increasing number of these extrasolar planets turn out to be rocky planets that are at least similar to Earth. If there are planetary systems elsewhere, the natural question is, is one of them similar to ours? Does it have a second Earth? And if so, is it home to life similar to us? Planetary systems are seemingly the norm in the universe. It appears that whenever stars form, planets do too. I consider the likelihood of Earth being the only place life has developed in such a vast cosmos to be fairly small, because the conditions necessary for life seem to be present in many regions of the universe. The requirements for life as we know it are liquid water, energy, and a particular chemical composition, that is carbon and a few minerals. These are the three things you need to create biological life as we know it. Three quarters of our planet are covered by water, the prerequisite for all that we consider to be and recognize as life. There's more or less a consensus on the key characteristics, and these naturally include the metabolism. From a thermodynamic perspective, life is an open system, which means it's continually exchanging chemicals and energy with the environment. Important key characteristics include growth, reproduction, and of course, the ability to adapt, which may result in a survival advantage. The Earth teems with life in a myriad of forms and varieties. But how life on Earth actually got started is one of the great mysteries. The origin of life on Earth is still an unresolved issue. We know that there was primitive life on the Earth around 3.5 to 3.7 billion years ago in the form of anaerobic bacteria that had to live without oxygen. They're very simple life forms. But even getting to this point is incredibly difficult. From the time life began to evolve on Earth around 4 billion years ago, it took another roughly 500 million years before the first primitive oxygen-producing life forms appeared. And it was only after a further 3 billion years that a huge diversity of species arose. 
This epoch has lasted for approximately 540 million years and continues to this day. Our solar system formed from a pre-solar nebula of hydrogen and dust following a supernova. Gravitational forces caused this cloud to collapse in on itself, a rotating cloud of dust and gas from which the sun formed 4.5 billion years ago. The planets form in orbit around the sun. The primordial Earth is a ball of molten rock enveloped in a toxic atmosphere. As it cools, the Earth's crust forms. Water vapor condenses and the oceans are formed. But how life was able to emerge from this inanimate matter remains a mystery to this day. The still unresolved question is, how is it possible that back then, 600 million years after the formation of the Earth, inanimate matter, basically rocks, gave rise to complex biological life? We still don't know today, but what we do know is how the first precursors, namely organic molecules such as amino acids, formed, as there's a very interesting experiment we can do to create them. In 1953, Stanley Miller tried to recreate the origins of life. In the laboratory of Nobel Prize winner Harold Urey, the young chemist mixed together the substances thought to have constituted the primordial atmosphere and oceans of the early Earth. He took some carbon, liquid water, irradiated it with energy in the form of sparks, so electrical energy in this case. He heated it up a bit and added a few other inorganic compounds in the hope of generating amino acids, which are the building blocks of life. Miller's experiment was an attempt at simulating abiogenesis. And after just a few attempts, Organic compounds were created in the mixture, including various amino acids, the building blocks of life. The Miller-Ura experimente the Miller-Ura experiments were based on the assumption prevailing at that time that the primordial atmosphere contained a large amount of ammonia and methane, and organic molecules can be generated from them via electrical discharges. Today, however, we know that the atmosphere probably contained very little ammonia and methane, and was composed mainly of nitrogen with some carbon dioxide. Miller's experiment didn't solve the mystery, but under primordial conditions it was possible for all the key parts of ribonucleic acid, or RNA for short, to be created, a precursor of DNA. RNA is not only an enzyme, it can store information too and plays a crucial role in the synthesis of protein in the cell. It's basically involved in synthesizing all of the proteins in a cell. It's an autocatalytic active molecule, but it should be mentioned that it's naturally assembled from other parts, namely sugars, phosphates and nucleotides. All of these are organic and inorganic molecules that first have to have formed and come together. So there's actually another preliminary stage here. And that means there's still really a stage. The first living cells may have formed around 4 billion years ago in deep cracks in the continental crusts, tectonic fracture zones that connect the Earth's mantle with the surface and in which gases and liquids circulate. Hydrothermal conditions prevail in these fissures, where the pressure is so high that water can remain liquid at temperatures far in excess of 100 degrees Celsius and thus contain large amounts of dissolved gases and minerals, favorable conditions for the formation of life. 
um Leben zu erzeugen und zu entwickeln. In order for life to form and evolve, it requires raw materials, but there was little inorganic material available, and only a few organic molecules on the early Earth. So we need a source of these raw materials. And naturally, there were places on the primordial Earth, like volcanic regions, lakes, and hydrothermal vents in the deep ocean, where organic compounds may have formed. In this way, the first cells could have formed on land, too. In this case, the necessary building blocks would have been supplied by hot springs and pools in volcanic regions. But there's actually a second source, namely space. Because during its first 700 million years, the primordial Earth was regularly bombarded by asteroids, comets and smaller objects, which brought materials such as water and even organic molecules to the early Earth. And we know from the composition of these small objects that they contain prebiotic molecules too. But even if the building blocks of life, or even simple organisms, arrived on the primordial Earth from outer space, it still doesn't explain how life can come about in the first place. It just shifts the mystery into the depths of space. What are the prerequisites for life? Well, let's take a look using our planetary system. First, we need a solid planet. So we can disregard all the gas planets beyond Jupiter. That leaves us with just four possible candidates. We also need the temperature to lie between zero and 50 degrees Celsius. And that equates to a very particular distance from our sun, which is pretty much here. So Mercury is disqualified, it's far too hot. Venus lies on the innermost edge, but because its atmosphere is composed mainly of CO2, a runaway greenhouse effect means a temperature between 400 and 500 degrees Celsius. The Earth lies right in the middle, no CO2 atmosphere, ideal temperature. And Mars lies just outside. It has no atmosphere to speak of anymore and is unfortunately too cold as a result, namely between minus 150 and zero degrees Celsius. Of all the planets in our solar system, Venus is closest to Earth. Its size and mass are similar to that of the Earth too. For a long time, scientists speculated about the existence of life on our planetary neighbor. But having been visited by several probes, the interest has waned. Most scientists now doubt the existence of life on Venus. With surface temperatures well above 400 degrees Celsius, a toxic atmosphere, and pressures similar to those in the deep sea, Venus appears to be hostile to life. Evidence of life will always be circumstantial. If an alien is standing in front of us, waving like in a Hollywood film, something I consider highly improbable, we might be certain. But otherwise, evidence for primitive life will always be circumstantial. This means we have to exclude all other possibilities. And that's what makes it so difficult to say when we really have discovered life. The search for extraterrestrial life in our solar system is focused primarily on Mars. It seems certain that it once had a completely different climate to the one it has today. Approximately 3.5 billion years ago, around the time life formed on Earth, it was, for a time at least, warm and wet there. Back then, Mars presumably had oceans that subsequently disappeared. Today, water exists in the form of ice at the poles and probably in seas below the surface. Mars is very interesting because it's a relatively large planet. In the past, the conditions on Mars in terms of atmosphere, temperature and so on were quite similar to those on Earth. But we don't see any Martians strolling around there today. So was it home to life or not? And why is there life on Earth? It's possible that Mars can help shed some light on the matter, which is why our ExoMars mission is designed to look specifically for life on Mars. It's exciting. It's possible that there still is or was something akin to life, not on the surface, but perhaps in the Martian interior. 
oder gab. In 2018, the ESA probe Mars Express discovered liquid water beneath the ice at the South Polar region. A whole system of ancient lakes may exist there, maybe millions or even billions of years old. Ideal locations to search for life. There are riverbeds there, and the conditions in the past were very different to those today. So it's possible that life existed there at some time. Finding the traces today is no easy task, though. A great deal of time has probably passed since then. If there are traces, I would assume they are to be found where there's still water, namely at the poles. Mars' gravity is too weak to hold on to liquid water and an appreciable atmosphere on a permanent basis. And even though Mars may have looked very different at one time, the conditions there have never been sufficient to support higher forms of life. What are the prerequisites for higher life forms to evolve in the universe? Well, first, we need a proper star, like our sun. If the star were larger, it would be much too hot and emit radiation in the so-called UV and X-ray regions, which is detrimental to biological life like ours. If the star were smaller than our sun, it would be a so-called red dwarf. And that's not good either, as they have the unpleasant habit of emitting X-ray flares, and X-rays are not biology friendly. And then you need a proper planet, of course, where proper means a rocky planet you can stand on, like the Earth or Mars. But it can't be too big or small either. If it's too small, like Mars, it can't hold on to an atmosphere which we need. And if it were too large, its gravity would be too strong for organisms to grow large, which we also need for them to develop large brains and become intelligent. What else do we need? Well, we need a large moon. Because, as we've learned from our moon, large moons stabilize the axis of rotation of a planet, and we need that for the climate to remain stable. Only under these conditions can higher life forms evolve. And we need a giant, a large gas planet like Jupiter, because, as we know, gas giants protect us from asteroid impacts. But it doesn't have to be a planet. In principle, any suitably large moon would do as well. Which is why the icy moons of Saturn and Jupiter have also come under the scrutiny of scientists in their search for life. The researchers believe that life is possible under their thick ice crusts. Probes have discovered vast oceans beneath the ice sheets. The scientists suspect that there are oceans on the distant moons up to 100 kilometers deep, kept liquid by the gravitational pull of the two giant planets. Also man hat flüssiges Wasser und eine Energiequelle. So you have liquid water and an energy source. These moons are almost certainly composed of the same material as the Earth and all the other rocky planets. In other words, they'll have carbon and minerals inside them. Minerals, carbon, energy, liquid water. These are the building blocks of life. And there's even an ice crust that protects the interior against cosmic radiation. And bearing in mind that life on Earth evidently formed in water under very extreme conditions, the hope is that the same sort of thing took place in these oceans as occurred on the early Earth. Studying Jupiter, and in particular three of its largest moons, is the objective of the European JUICE mission. JUICE the Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer should provide us with new insights into the water-rich moons Callisto, Europa, and Ganymede. The probe will take seven years to fly from the Earth to the Jovian system, which it will spend several years investigating. At the end of its journey in 2032, JUICE will enter into orbit around Ganymede, from where it will analyze the moon. With a diameter of 5,262 kilometers, it's the largest moon in our planetary system. Ganymede has a magnetic field and, even though very thin, an oxygen atmosphere. Ganymede, muss man sich vorstellen, 
Ganymede is a huge moon, much bigger than our moon. If it didn't happen to be orbiting Jupiter, it would be classified as a planet because it's so big. It has a diameter of around 5,300 kilometers, so it's really huge. That's almost the size of Mars. So it's a very large moon, and that's what makes it so interesting. We think that the conditions there may be conducive to something like life. It could be that we discover something amazing there. Another candidate for life is Saturn's moon Enceladus. Its surface is made of pristine white snow. Although it picks up dust on its journey through space, it doesn't appear dirty. The fresh snow is produced by water that continually erupts from its surface and crystallizes. Liquid water is a prerequisite for life. So if there's liquid water beneath the ice crust and an energy source, like tidal forces that deform the moon, then it fulfills the conditions that could theoretically allow life to form. There's hope to find proof on Saturn's moon Enceladus where geysers have been discovered. That means water from the ocean that shoots out into space through cracks in the surface and vaporize. So the hope is that an analysis of this material will provide clues as to the composition of the water in the ocean. And if we're lucky, perhaps we'll find organic compounds in it. The geysers on Enceladus were discovered by the Cassini-Huygens mission. The two coupled probes were given the job to study Saturn and its moon. Huygens was designed as a lander. Its destination, Titan. Another interesting object in our solar system is the Saturnian moon Titan, and for several reasons. First, it's the only moon with an atmosphere which consists mainly of nitrogen. It's the only moon which has liquid on its surface. In this case, liquid hydrocarbons, primarily methane. Methane does there what water does here on Earth. It has a solid surface and it appears to have a kind of cycle too of hydrocarbons. On Earth, we have a water cycle where it rains. The water soaks into the ground, evaporates and forms clouds again, creating a water cycle that's critical for life on Earth. There seems to be a similar cycle on Titan, but involving methane and other hydrocarbons. It would be extremely interesting to take a spoonful of liquid from one of these methane lakes and analyze it. In January 2005, Huygens began its descent to the surface of Titan. The images show a barren world with rivers and lakes of methane. And it's possible that this hydrocarbon could somehow have given rise to some form of primitive life. The moons in our planetary system appear to be good candidates for extraterrestrial life. I reckon Enceladus will be the first place we discover life. We'll send a probe through these water plumes that have formed along the ice fissures and extend kilometers into space. An element analysis may show amino acids, more complex compounds and even organic material. And then we'll conclude that this moon is home to primitive life. That's my prediction, that it'll be where we discover extraterrestrial life first. The search for life is one of our biggest and probably most exciting scientific endeavors. And since the first planet outside our solar system was discovered in 1995, the search for a new world has captured our collective imagination. Do exoplanets actually exist? That is, planets in other solar systems. Today, the answer is clear. The discovery of another exoplanet is announced on an almost daily basis. We now know of many thousands of exoplanets, but it's actually not that long since the first one was discovered. 
And we now know why every star has not just one planet, but must have many, because they contain the initial rotation of the entire planetary system. They contain the so-called angular momentum. The key question, however, is, how many of these planets are Earth-like, and in particular, are as large as the Earth so that life can develop on them? And we now know there aren't really that many of them. One particularly fascinating planetary system is TRAPPIST-1. Its central star, TRAPPIST-1a, was only discovered in 1999. Seven rocky planets orbit the star, which is 40 light years away. In terms of their mass and diameter, these planets are comparable to the Earth. And the conditions on a few of them may even be hospitable to life. The TRAPPIST-1 system is interesting because it has seven small planets, and two of them are at a distance from their star that could allow water on the surface to exist in liquid form. We would consider them potentially habitable, if it actually were there. We haven't detected water yet, but they are situated at the right distance for it. The seven rocky planets that orbit the dwarf star TRAPPIST-1a fascinate scientists. But above each planet hovers a big question mark as well. Their size and density can be reliably determined. But whether the TRAPPIST-1 planets actually have an atmosphere or even oceans of water is still unknown. Scientists presume they do, but their assumptions are based solely on models thus far. Getting observational evidence is difficult for the TRAPPIST system too. So we're still looking for a system that's Earth-like, or rather Earth-Sun-like, where we can confirm the atmosphere of an Earth-like planet with certainty. In order to study exoplanets and, if present, their atmospheres in more detail, the scientists are using the latest generation of telescopes. Nonetheless, even these will not make it possible to observe details on their surfaces directly. The distances are simply too great. You can't simply point a giant telescope at the planet and look at it. At the moment, you have to rely on chemical signatures. That is, you look for water. You look for evidence of water. And some, using clever techniques, the astronomers have succeeded in detecting water on such planets for the first time. They are, of course, tiny signals, and if there's water, we conclude there could be life, too. There's now certainty that our solar system is not an exceptional case, and the formation of planets is a perfectly normal process in the universe. Scientists have identified thousands of exoplanets so far, and they describe many of them as Earth-like. The closest extrasolar planets discovered thus far orbit the star Proxima Centauri, around 4.2 light years away. The problem is that Proxima Centauri is a star that has less mass than the Sun and is not so stable. This means that if you were on a planet there, you'd have to reckon with being regularly blasted with UV radiation, which isn't so good for living organisms. You'd get pretty sunburnt there. But still, it's just four light years away. And four light years is a distance you could potentially span with a probe sometime in the future. The exoplanet Proxima Centauri b was discovered in August 2016 from Earth by the European Southern Observatory, ESO. An Earth-sized rocky planet that orbits within the habitable zone of the Red Dwarf and could, theoretically at least, harbor life. A second planet in the system outside the habitable zone was then discovered in 2019, Proxima Centauri c. 
So, how do we find exoplanets? It's actually pretty difficult, because planets are extremely dim, whereas the central star is so bright, it dominates everything else. For that reason, we can never observe planets directly. But there are a few tricks we can use, and the best known is the so-called transit method. How does it work? If we look at a star from Earth, it can happen that the planet passes in front of the disk. And when this happens, it obscures a tiny part of the disk, and the star's brightness reduces very slightly. Using modern detectors, we can measure this drop very precisely. Better yet, just before the planet enters the disk, the light from the star is only obscured by the planet's atmosphere. And when this happens, we can measure the concentration and composition of the atmosphere fairly precisely. But this still doesn't answer the question, is there life on an exoplanet like that? Every star in our universe has its own system of planets. This much seems certain. And our galaxy alone contains an estimated 100 to 400 billion stars. But are there other worlds out there that harbor life? In the search for extrasolar planets, we have one major goal. We're looking for a celestial body that has similar properties to our home planet. The ideal planet should be orbiting a star of a similar size and age to our Sun. It should be roughly the same size as the Earth and be at a favorable distance within the habitable zone of its star. The German Aerospace Center DLR is also searching for such a planet. Its space telescope Plato has the mission to find rocky planets the size of the Earth that are orbiting nearby Sun-like stars. Plato will observe two regions. The cameras allow us to observe a very large portion of the sky, as they are divided into four groups whose lines of sight are slightly offset with respect to one another, giving us a wide field of view. We'll survey a region for at least two years, because we want to discover planets that have an orbitable period of up to a year. As such, we have to observe for at least one year, in order to discover a transit. And once we have a possible candidate, we'll then begin the Earth-based program, which involves radial velocity measurements to determine the masses. For the Earth-based observation program, a brand new, powerful planet hunter is currently under construction. The ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope of the European Southern Observatory ESO. The super telescope is located in the dry and near cloudless Atacama Desert in Chile. With its 39-meter mirror, it will operate in the optical and infrared region of the spectrum and be capable of discovering and observing exoplanets directly. It will also study their atmospheres, temperatures, and seasonal weather conditions. The atmospheres of the distant planets in particular would provide evidence of the possible existence of life. The scientists are looking for so-called biomarkers, molecules that are produced by living organisms like microbes and algae, which then accumulate in the atmosphere. The way we'll discover life for the first time will be by finding an atmosphere with maybe oxygen, a bit of carbon dioxide and methane, and we'll conclude that there must be an oxygen producer, and oxygen must be continuously being replenished. And that can only really be achieved by biological life as we know it. There are countless planets in our universe. But scientists are yet to find one that fulfills all the conditions necessary for life. And even if we do find such a planet, we cannot be certain that life, perhaps even higher forms of life, has developed. Carbon, energy, a few minerals, liquid water, and bam, 
Does life always develop on a planet under these circumstances? Or is it actually the result of a series of random events, so that here on Earth we just got really lucky? This naturally begs the question, how much life is there in the universe? This is the fundamental scientific question. Is there a process that inevitably leads in this direction? Scientists are also searching for the possible origins of life in the seemingly empty regions of space between the stars and planetary systems. Complex molecules exist everywhere in the universe, including the exact same molecules that served as the basis for life on Earth. They're found in the huge interstellar clouds of gas and dust from which new stars are born. There, minute dust particles repeatedly collide with individual atoms and can, over millions of years, combine to create ever more complex molecules. Molecules are formed in many regions, but most notably in the interstellar clouds, the regions between the stars. And we've now discovered over 200 really important molecules there. And another four or five are discovered each year. These molecules are mainly discovered using radio telescopes. And it's very exciting, of course. The first ever molecule to form in the universe shortly after the Big Bang was detected in 2019 by the Flying Observatory SOFIA. Helium hydride. Shortly after the Big Bang, a few very light elements were produced, including hydrogen and helium. And it's from these two elements that the first molecule formed. As it is as the universe cooled, this molecule could combine with hydrogen to produce molecular hydrogen. And this is really important, because it more or less formed the basis of the first large stars in the universe. The very first helium hydride molecules formed over 13 billion years ago. It marked the beginning of chemistry in the cosmos. This latest discovery is evidence of nature's tendency to form molecules. Sophia isn't specifically looking for extraterrestrial life forms. Rather, we're looking for chemical indicators and organic molecules. And we're finding them. There are a lot of organic molecules in space, like acetic acid, alcohol, and so on. In the far infrared and radio spectrum in particular, many of which are unknown. We also see a lot of spectra that indicate the presence of molecules that are new to science or haven't been identified yet. Despite the harsh conditions in space, ever more complex molecules are being discovered. By studying molecule formation in the interstellar medium, scientists hope to learn more about how life formed on Earth. What will extraterrestrial life look like? Little green men or aliens with enormous heads? It's actually quite simple. Primitive life, that is, single-celled organisms, will almost certainly be round. When it comes to higher life forms, it depends on whether they can move or not. Trees can't move, which is why they're rotationally symmetric. If something can move, it always has a plane of symmetry and its body is then mirror symmetric. And that's exactly what we expect extraterrestrial life to be like. But if we find a planet that actually does have life on it, we expect it to be inhabited by so-called extremophiles. These are organisms that have adapted to extreme environmental conditions, such as high temperatures, extreme aridity, or can withstand cosmic radiation. Whether or not terrestrial extremophile organisms can survive the inhospitable conditions of space is being investigated on ISS-2. On the space station, bacteria, algae, lichens, and fungi are being exposed to the vacuum of space for extended periods of time, and some of them return to Earth unscathed. 
Tardigrades are true masters of survival. Barely a millimeter in size, these creatures live in mosses and have to cope with extreme changes in the conditions, from wet to totally dry. Tardigrades are able to completely dry out or freeze solid, and when the environmental conditions improve again, that is, when it gets wetter or warmer, they rehydrate or thaw out and go searching for food once more. The TARDIS project, Tardigrades in Space, involved sending tardigrades on a trip to space. In their dried up, suspended animation form known as their tun state, they spent 10 days in Earth's orbit exposed to the conditions in space. The majority of the moss and water dwellers survived the vacuum unscathed. Some of the animals were exposed to the hostile cosmic radiation. 2% survived even that. What prompted this experiment are the incredible capabilities of the tardigrades, their resilience to drought, cold, and above all, cosmic and other forms of radiation. And the idea of this experiment was to see how the tardigrades, as living organisms, could cope with the harsh conditions in space. At the end of the experiment, the tardigrades returned to Earth and we examined how well they survived their trip to space. Astrobiologists expect that extraterrestrial life could possibly look like this, or similar. At any rate, it has been demonstrated that certain organisms are able to survive unprotected in space. Tardigrades are really cute little creatures, especially when you observe them after they come back from a trip to space and you rehydrate them. And they just pick up where they left off and continue their life cycle as if nothing has happened. It's certainly interesting. And we're finding more and more exotic life forms on Earth. There's a great deal we still don't know about our own planet. In mines in South Africa, for example, we're discovering organisms deep inside the Earth where we never thought it possible for life to exist. We're continually finding new exotic forms of life here on Earth. So we're still learning about living organisms on our own planet. This means that there may be forms of life in our solar system and even on extrasolar planets that we can't imagine today. In April 2019, a private Israeli space probe smashed into the moon. On board the crashed lander were several thousand tardigrades in their dried out state. So now there's life on the moon, albeit in a state of suspended animation. Life in space? Why look for it? Maybe they're already trying to contact us. It was with this in mind that in 1961, the first conference on the search for extraterrestrial signals was held, the so-called SETI. There are many such projects nowadays, but for a long time, nothing was detected. Until in 1977, a highly unusual signal was recorded, the so-called WOW signal. Why was it called WOW signal? Well, after over 10 years of searching, a researcher came in one morning and looked over the printout from the previous night and saw this huge signal and was so overwhelmed, he wrote beside it, WOW. The so-called WOW signal is a narrow band radio signal from outer space that was significantly stronger than the background noise. The unusual signal was received on August 15, 1977 by the Big Ear radio telescope at Ohio State University. It was recorded by astrophysicist Jerry Eman as part of the SETI project. SETI refers to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. In the early 1960s, Astronomer Frank Drake, using the Green Bank radio telescope, became the first person to look for signals and messages from outer space. The SETI project was born, but no message has been received to this day. And the WOW signal 
was presumably the result of a burst of gamma rays. Dass man Funksignale auffängt, da muss man wahrscheinlich noch ein bisschen Glück haben. You probably need a fair bit of luck to intercept a radio signal. There are two problems here. Problem number one, the others are a long way away, so the radio signal that arrives here is extremely weak. Problem number two, it has to be sent at the right time as well. Imagine that, say, 10 million years ago, the aliens sent radio signals in our direction for a million years. Unfortunately, we weren't in a position to receive them back then. So, you have to send the radio signal at the right time. And maybe these aliens only survived for a million years. And then somehow destroyed themselves. Something mankind can relate to. It could also happen to us, that we destroy ourselves. So the time has to be right. Transmitters and receivers have to be in a position to send and receive at exactly the right time. The researchers have now been looking for signals from an alien civilization for over half a century, without success. Surely billions of Earth-like planets should provide ample opportunities for intelligent life to evolve. Intelligent life is really a whole new dimension. If we consider how life has evolved on Earth, we see that microbes have been around for 4.5 billion years. But humans have only been around for 2 million so far. We don't know how long it will go on for. And if we consider the complexity in the evolution from primitive bacteria to human beings, there is a vast number of intermediate stages involved. It's incredibly difficult to imagine that these intermediate stages could actually occur in exactly the same way on another planet in our universe. But you have to keep an open mind. And it's quite possible that intelligent life has evolved elsewhere in the universe. Maybe even under different conditions. The emergence of intelligent life is tremendously complex. But the sheer endless number of distant planets alone is a strong argument for intelligent life existing, or having existed, somewhere else in the universe. When? and for how long it existed, or whether it's only now evolving, and where in the cosmos it may be, these are unanswerable questions. In principle, is it right? It's basically true to say that the universe could be relatively densely populated, as it were, and we may still be unable to detect the others. Imagine the following scenario. There's a planet about the size of the Earth, and it's called Kepler-452b. It takes 384 days to orbit its star, which is about the same size as the Sun. The difference between this planet and our Earth is that it's 1.5 billion years older. If people lived there, they may have been broadcasting messages hundreds of millions of years ago. But the dinosaurs on Earth weren't able to receive them yet. And a few hundred million years later, they couldn't transmit any more because all their resources were used up or something. So now that we're able to receive, they can't send any more. Humankind has only been broadcasting signals into space for a little over 100 years. Distance and time are key factors that cannot be influenced when it comes to the search for signals from outer space. We can also turn the question around. What could aliens discover about us? Well, they would spectroscopically analyze our atmosphere and say, wow, that's a weird atmosphere. Then they try to detect electromagnetic waves, which they'd succeed in as we generate them artificially, for instance, for our TV broadcasts. They may even be able to watch our programs with very sensitive detectors. So when you think about it, some of those programming directors should perhaps reconsider what they broadcast because our television programs are the first thing the aliens will discover about us since they're transmitted at high power. As long ago as 1950, physicist Enrico Fermi asked his colleagues over lunch, where are they? What he meant was the space-faring aliens who, assuming they existed, should have visited Earth long ago. The conclusion? Since they aren't here, 
there can't be another technologically advanced, intelligent species in our galaxy. We have, in the meantime, broadcast messages deep into the universe in the hope that extraterrestrials might receive them, but no response so far. So, where are they? Well, it could be that we're the only ones in our galaxy, the Milky Way, perhaps even in the whole universe. Or will we meet them when we travel to other stars sometime in the future? It can't be ruled out, but seems pretty unlikely, as so far there's only been resounding silence. Primitive life may nonetheless exist, and if it does, we'll find it. At present, we know of just one celestial body where life exists, our planet Earth. And scientists are faced with a mystery. They still don't know how inanimate material can give rise to life in the first place. But the necessary building blocks apparently exist throughout the entire cosmos. And there's one thing about which the scientists are certain. The discovery of life, though most likely in a primitive form, in our planetary system or galaxy, is just a matter of time.